Everything is what it is, isn't what it isn't, and nothing is neither or both. Now that's a plain English formulation of what the logical absolutes are all about. I've had lots of conversations with people about the logical absolutes. People who understand them, people who don't, people who partially understand and, and misuse and apply them, people who try to use them as a, the foundation for an argument for the existence of God, um, and people who don't understand their significance, or people who, when they do understand them, downplay the significance. And that's why I thought I'd use the logical absolutes as the first video in this series that I'm working on that I'm kind of halfway calling the foundational series. Let's begin at the beginning. And while this can be a difficult subject for some to broach, I'm going to do my best to make it as simple as possible. The logical absolutes are called a number of different things. The logical absolutes, the three logical absolutes, the laws of logical thought, the foundations of reason, and probably a bunch of others. And it doesn't matter so much what you call them. But the three are normally expressed as the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of excluded middle. The plain English formulation I gave at the top is just a combination of all three of them. And we can take a look at each of them individually and see how that works out. The law of identity merely states that A equals A, which means a thing is whatever that thing is. The law of non-contradiction states that A does not equal not A, or a thing is not whatever it isn't. And most people looking at those immediately recognize that these are just tautologies, that these are simple, basic truth statements. They're, and that's absolutely correct. Uh, there's a bit more to it than that. The third one, the law of excluded middle, states that everything is either A or not A, or reformulated, nothing is neither A nor not A, nor both A and not A. Everything has to fit into A or not A. So putting all that together, you get the statement that I had at the beginning of the video. Everything is what it is, isn't what it isn't, and nothing is neither or both. They're tautologies. They are truth statements. They are absolutely true. And some people get hung up on the, on the label that calls them laws. And they want to claim that, oh, if these are laws, then there must be a law giver. Um, this is not far removed from the moral argument, and it's wrong. These are not prescriptive laws, like a speed limit. Uh, a speed limit is along the lines of, thou shalt not exceed 55, 65, 75 miles an hour, whatever. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, it just means there's consequences to it. Those are prescriptive laws. The natural laws, or descriptive laws, are those things that we recognize as true about the reality we experience. These fit into that category at a very basic level. The interesting thing about the logical absolutes is that they actually are pure tautologies, pure truth statements that would be true in every possible universe with no exceptions. This is difficult for some people to grasp, in particular people who have been uh, developing an interest in multiverse and quantum mechanics and quantum indeterminacy and things that run counter to our intuitions. And they will send in examples sometimes that they think violate the laws of logical thought. And in fact, they don't violate those laws. Uh, I've had people say that, well, light acts like a particle and a wave. Okay, that's not a violation of the laws of logical thought. The fact that you, that it 
doesn't fit into one category that you have defined exclusively is not a violation of this. And when it comes to things like quantum indeterminacy, you could say a thing is indeterminate or not indeterminate, and it's not neither or both. Apart from some confusion about how these things are true everywhere, in all possible universes, set that aside for a moment. They are clearly, obviously true in the reality we experience. It's the nature of a tautology. When people start to realize that that's all there is to this, the next response that I often get is, well, they're not telling us anything about anything. They're not telling us what categories things fit into. They're not, you know, doing anything to give us more information about the reality that we experience. They're just kind of a framework. Yes, that is exactly what they are. Well, that makes them useless propositions. I don't know why we wasted any time discussing them, and it doesn't matter that they're always true. I strongly disagree and would say that that's flatly wrong. They're far from useless. The framework is what allows us to establish any store, any sort of epistemological grounds. These laws are what allow us to know what we know. They're allow us. They're what allow us to determine truth self-evident truths that allow us to build upon them. They are the foundation of mathematics. They are the foundations of all logical thought. And one of the best ways I've found to represent them in a way that demonstrates their usefulness is if you were to create the simplest Venn diagram possible, a single circle on a field and you label that circle A and everything outside of that circle which is an unbounded I mean not sometimes we draw them in rectangles but it's actually an unbounded uh, representation of everything else that area is not A the logical absolutes are just a description of that simple Venn diagram, which becomes the foundation for math and set theory and, and thought. It's what allows us to even have categories. The very fact that these are true allow us to make use of labels and identity and categories to discover other truths or to discover truth as best as we can. people who have tried to argue against the logical absolutes and saying, well, these aren't, you know, these aren't actually absolutes, they're not absolutely true, without realizing it, have to assume that the, the logical absolutes are true in order to attempt to argue that they're not true. That is the definition of a self-defeating argument. They are beginning. I mean, you could do it. You could, you could assume something that is true in order to demonstrate an absurdity, a reducto ad absurdum argument. But the assumption that they're true, if it's a foundational principle of the demonstration that they are false, demonstrates that they are true and you are not, you've now demonstrated nothing more than a contradiction. And you've created a reducto argument, a reducto ad absurdum argument that refutes your claim and affirms that the absolutes are true. Now, I know a lot of this gets messy for a lot of people. I mean, I'm sure there's you know, a minimal portion, even of, of my subscribers or people who enjoy the Atheist Experience TV show, who are really, really interested in these sort of foundational philosophical topics. I'm going to go through quite a bunch of them uh, over the coming weeks and months because I want videos that I can point people to that explain what I mean. 
when I use certain words and certain phrases without having to re-explain them over and over again. Everything is what it is, isn't what it isn't, and nothing is neither or both. You can think of it that way, or if you prefer, A equals A, A does not equal not A, and everything is either A or not A. Or you could just draw a Venn diagram. The simplest and easiest confirmation that this is absolutely true. Everything is either in that circle of A or not. Nothing is both inside and outside the circle. Ah, they say, but what about more complicated Venn diagrams where you have circles overlapping? Yes, the logical absolutes are what allow that. And still, when the circles overlap, there is nothing that is both inside the circle and not inside the circle. If you have two circles overlapping, and you point to that section of overlap, that section is in both circles. And it is not, not in both circles. That's the beauty of all of this. It's the single bit of information that we use to build all rational thought that is directly analogous to registers and computers that we then construct everything off of. Is it important that everybody recognize this? I don't know. For some people, it's so ingrained in the way we think and, and then in the statements that we process in our culture that it is it seems intuitively true it's, it seems to be a just so story I raise the point and the explanation because I have some minor concerns that there are people who failing to recognize the truth of this and the value of this may set themselves up for mistakes. I don't know for sure. But that's my quick take on the logical absolutes. There's a lot more to the subject. There's no way a short video is going to encompass everything about the laws of thought. But hopefully between the different descriptions and the Venn diagram, people will realize that these are merely self-evident, basic, logical truths that we then use as the foundation. So that when somebody asks us, well, how do you know what you know? Or how do you know that this is true? How do you know that one plus one equals two? It's because everything reduces to this simple diagram, the foundation of set theory, which we know is absolutely true. The other day I mentioned some people who were trying to multiply possibilities, that something becomes possible if it's possible that it's possible. That just doesn't work. But if you begin with truths, that's how you can affirm other truths. It is the foundation on which we can construct logical syllogisms and propositional logic and determine their validity and soundness. And that's the subject of the next video. Thanks for watching.